Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Bruce Harold, Chair of the Public Safety, Civil Rights and Technology Committee. Today is Wednesday, February 19th at 2 o'clock. I'm here with Vice Chair Nick Licata and Staff Jennifer Samuels. Thank you for being here this afternoon. We have three items we'd like to discuss uh, right after public comment. And at this point, I will open it up for public comment. I believe we have some speakers. Thank you for being here. I'll call you in the order that you signed up. Uh, Jan Boltman, followed by Ms. Queen Pearl. <coughs> Hello. Hi, council members. It's really nice to see you. Uh, my name is Jan Boltman, and I'm a member of the Seattle Privacy Coalition, which you can find on the web at seattleprivacy.org. I'm here because I want to talk about Council Bill 117996, which accepts a federal grant for $1.6 million. First, I want to acknowledge the efforts that SPD has put into crafting a privacy policy for their proposed booking photo comparison system. And I also want to thank especially Vin in Councilmember Harrell's office, who has been so responsive and very helpful in understanding the finer points of this legislation. But what I really want to say addresses the broader question of accepting federal funds for Seattle Police Department equipment. And what I want to say is that this is a very bad practice and that started up when this country was in a state of fear after 9-11 and that we need to stop it. We've spent the past 10 months learning about ways that the departments of our federal government has systematically violated the privacy of Americans, conducting wireless, dragnet, domestic surveillance. Department of Homeland Security has poured billions of black budget dollars into funding fusion centers and state and local law enforcement agencies. This encourages law enforcement agencies to purchase equipment before they even have a plan for how to use it. This is how the City of Seattle Police Department ended up with drones that it can't use and surveillance cameras that it can't turn on. What a waste. Accepting these grants has the unintended consequence of moving local law enforcement agencies out from under the control of local oversight bodies such as yourselves. It is profoundly anti-democratic. If the City of Seattle the Police Department has needs for equipment that are not being met, we want to see those included in the mayor's budget. We don't want to see any purchase and deployment of surveillance equipment, or sorry, we do want to see any purchase and deployment of surveillance equipment discussed at public hearings, not behind closed doors where only police department representatives are present. I'm sorry, I know I'm out of time, but I just want to say, please don't vote on this bill today. Schedule a public hearing and hold it when the public can actually attend on an evening or a weekend. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Queen Pearl, followed by Sam Bellamil. Good day, everyone. Uh, this is Black History Month, and um, I hope I'm black enough to speak. Um, I just have a few concerns to date, and I always will be when our rights are being violated. First of all, I'm a child of God. I don't fear nobody, and I've been taught that very, very thoroughly from a child up, but I had to learn it because, you know, little things creep into your life as you, you know, go on. And so anyway, I was able to go up to Olympia and go to the governor's office. And um, it was really strange, the order up there uh, used to be when we would go up and visit with Dan Evans and, and everything would be so lovely because he was so concerned about what was going on in the uh, world at that time. And then all of a sudden, I said, why are the people so disrespectful? And it goes on here, too. I was up at the mayor's floor, and here come this man jumping out, talking about, is everything all right? And I said, if it's not, oh, we'll turn up the heat. So I went and looked up the word heat. I said, the heat, that's what they used to call the popo, you know, the police, whatever you want to call them. I said, you don't need no heat on me. I'm, I got the fire of the Lord in my life, okay? I'm heated all right because we're being violated. We're being disrespected after a governor sat up in there and allowed us to grace his presence. You go up there and them folk act like they own something. Smoking crack, drinking crack, doping crack, just doped up. And I don't like it because I got a right 
to be here. I got a right to the tree of life. Did you know that? Huh? So I hope you get a good look at my face, Miss Pelka, coming back from wherever you were. What, to disrupt this city again? Oh, no, I come to put it in order because my God did everything decent and in order, and we're going to have some order around here. Thank you, Ms. Pearl. Thank you very much. Sam Bellamino, followed by Mr. Alex Zimmerman. Yep, my name is uh, Sam Bellamino. I'm here with Stand Up America, and, you know, we're coming to speak with you about every issue that citizens are concerned with because they can't be here at a time that you schedule at 2 p.m. while they're at work. You know, you're having a meeting tonight, 5.30. Congratulations, finally one at night. And what are you doing? You're appointing people to offices. While we're talking about federal funds being used to spy on citizens, you hold that during the day so citizens can't attend. But when you get to celebrate your accomplishment of finding the right person to be in an office, you'll hold it at night. You have a mayor that talked yesterday about the progressive city and the fear of the right and how they've tried to screw us. When has the city ever had a problem with Republicans? This has been democratically dominated for years. Your boogeyman in the freaking box isn't working. Why are you not entering into the process allowing citizens to discuss with you, to own the process, to own the instrument they created, their government? We don't want the drones. We don't want your mesh network. We don't want your facial recognition. We've seen crime drastically fall over the last 30 years. Gun violence fall, but yet you want to put more gun regulations in, more spying networks in, because of what threat? The right? Because we might not be a progressive city? You guys have harmed the citizens for so long you're taking our tax dollars, $120,000 each, when that could be funding. Uh, we just had another homeless person die because of the elements. You guys didn't even hold a moment of silence. Why? Oh, that's because they're not in the government. They're, they weren't a, a lawyer or someone in your college or someone respected within some other government institution like Dow Constantine or, sorry, the executive of King County, the mayor of Seattle, because if something happened to them, we'd have a moment of silence. But when citizens are harmed by your actions, we ignore it, sweep it under the rugs, hold a meeting during a time they can't attend to speak up about it, and it's gone forever. Don't vote on anything today unless it's held at a time that citizens can be present. Start allowing citizens back into the process to quit freaking making boogeymans for us to chase after and quit insulting the citizens when they come up here to tell you how they feel. Thank you, Mr. Bellamio. Uh, Alex Zimmerman, followed by Orion Abraha. Hi, my name is Alex Zimmerman, and I am president of Stand Up America. It's very good, so today a new civil rights boss present, for my understanding, and will be approved today. Because question what is we have with you when we talk about this for years? Hundred times, couple hundred times, almost 500 times. Uh, can two minutes, what is you have, transfer to 30 seconds? Yes, you can. So tomorrow, when you want this, it will be 30 second speech for people. It's very nice. I like you. Because this expression, idiot, always don't have a limit. We talk with you about this two minutes, move to three minutes, and five minutes, like every city have. You only one city in state Washington who don't have three minutes and five minutes for organization. How people can be involved in business when a new boss of human service department or committee sit down here, he don't respond to very simple point. Three minutes, only one minute different. You cannot jump this. For five years we're talking about this. Thousand times. You cannot do this. Guys, what does it show you? It shows you so you degenerate idiot. You are mafia organized criminals. Because move from two minutes to three minutes like everybody is a normal. When I told you something, move to something what is unusual, yeah, but two minutes is unusual. And cut a microphone, you bring a new policy last month in December, you know what it means last year, new policy what is cut constitution totally. It's go everywhere right now. It's go from Washington, D.C. to Seattle to Washington, from Washington, D.C. to Washington State. Guys, all America right now is sick from you because you crook, a mafia, a bandito. It's exactly who you are. Your hand in human blood and everything what is we ask with you is a constitution, freedom of speech, and common sense, little bit common sense. So move from two minutes to Thank three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Minutes. Just make involvement people more and 
Human Service Department Thank supposed you. to be open this Pandora up. box and sue you like a crooks. Orian Abraha, followed by Crystal Starhart. Apologize if I mispronounce your name. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to explain, but I'm here almost 10 years. I don't believe it. I become homeless. I help the community. This picture, I give you gifts. We, the civilian, we try to run this way, and you guys, you want to go that way. So one day, we go one way. I, that's my belief, American dream. Uh, I'll leave it here. Let me, uh, my name is Orian Abraha. I have uh, been a Seattle resident since August 1986. I participate in such a meeting before today. I would like to get an answer for the Seattle Police Department Office Professional Accountability, OPA, case number this, this, has been with OPA since 19 of, uh, 2004. There is a letter from OPA dated May 17, 2004, which states that investigation has been completed and that the decision-making process will take little longer. I do not receive the letter on time. So. You, the representative, and the bureaucracy, you don't have any connection. I didn't get all this response from you. On, you, you respond on time, but I didn't receive it. It takes me three years to receive. I hire a lawyer. Why it's happened? We elect you. You serve us. I know. I believe on that. What's in between? It doesn't solve this problem. So I need, please, to revise again my case. They you systematically. They send me to the lawyer, the city lawyer. He get the taxpayer's money, and he defend me. He make me trick, and he make he close the case by uh, extending the time, the time. So I need, please, I'll leave the case, and please, again, help me. I'm a citizen. I know I have the right. I know you can do it. I believe on that. That's why America. That's why I talk. In Africa, I don't say nothing. Just boom. No problem, but that's why. You give me a freedom, listen to me. That's it. Thank that's you very much, ask. sir. Please. Thank Crystal, you. thank you, Mr. Abraha. <coughs> Crystal, my staff will take your papers and we'll look into your matter. Crystal yeah, Starhart, followed by Mr. David Robinson. Well, thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, I'm a known activist. I've been an activist for a long time. Um, since 9-11, I have been involved in the 9-11 Visibility Truth Movement, and I know I've been on the watch list for years. I, I've been under surveillance, and there's been data, monitor, data collection and monitoring, people following me and stalking me. And since 2011, I've been targeted for burglaries. And these are not ordinary burglaries, these are covert entry burglaries. And I know that the Department of Homeland Security's personnel is involved with this because I've talked to, to one sheriff, Pete Warner, when I confronted him about harassment from one of his law enforcement officers, Deputy Patrick Rayner. And when I confronted Pete Warner, he said he could not control what another agency's personnel were doing. He could only ask his men to stay away from them. And I also asked my younger brother to spend one night with me because these burglaries were occurring even while I was asleep, I was targeted. And they had the room I slept in monitored so they'd know when I was asleep. Files were altered on my computer. Money was still stolen out of my wallet. Keys were stolen out of my fanny pack. And the police would do nothing about this. Local law enforcement would not touch these people. And Patrick Rayner harassed me, and eventually he had me arrested. And this should not be going on in America. And I know that this has been going on to other people, because one activist I know in this area has told me there's been a, an out-of-court settlement around these kind of things. And there's gag orders put on these settlements. And nobody talks about them. There's gag orders on the people. My FOIAs have been denied. My FOIA appeals have been denied because I've requested information about myself, because I've known I've been an activist on the watch list, and I cannot get anything out of these people. And my public disclosure your, your request Your time to is running out. Would you wrap up, please? Okay. Thank you. 
Well, the thing is, if you do not control the Department of Homeland Security and their criminal operations, they will control you and everyone around you and the whole, the whole of society because no one can be protected from these criminal operations. I've had four storage units burglarized. I've, I'm in my four storage facility now. I've got pictures of locks that have been picked. Th thank you for your testimony, ma'am. I'm going to have to close. The Ceiling wires cut. Thank you very much. Uh, David Robinson, followed by Phil Mosek. Good afternoon, council members. Uh, I'm here also to talk about uh, uh, Bill 117196. Um, so I'll start specifically talking about the... Um, the are you, sir? I'm David Robinson. Um, I, I have many questions about the uh, booking database plans, uh, uh, the uh, booking photo database, and uh, the fact that I have so many questions is, is really sort of the larger problem that uh, some of us are addressing here today. But um, I looked over the uh, documentation of what was going to go into the police manual, and uh, I just wanted to look at a few of these things. Uh, I mean, it says there that this is not going to be shared uh, uh, without, uh, you know, proper oversight, correct, uh, uh, you know, agency relationships and so on. But, I mean, once, once uh, a database is set up like this, that data is completely free to whoever has a warrant or a subpoena to get hold of it. And so it's, it's not a realistic thing for uh, you to have a, a statement saying it's not going to be shared. It's going to be completely shared. If the data is collected, it's going to be used the way anybody who wants to go to the trouble of getting it, wants to do. Um, also, uh, there's a statement in there that this won't be connected up to any live cameras, that there won't be live camera feeds. Uh, and I presume that's referring to the, uh, the famous uh, uh, cameras that were set up uh, with another federal uh, grant a year ago, which we'll come back to, which I'll come back to. The, this, this also is, is a little bit questionable when you consider that a system like that is practically useless without quick transmission between the field and back in. It's not like people are going to be, you know, sending couriers with Polaroid shots to, to load into the system to compare to people. Uh, they're going to be transmitting these things over the mesh network, I assume, uh, and, and this will be uh, efficient, instantaneous, and uh, it's effectively live. Not to mention the fact that every one of those cameras that's been installed out there could, with the flick of a mouse, be turned on and, uh, and used for this. And there's nothing in the policy which prevents that from being done, uh, even without council review. Uh, Mr. Robinson, your time is out. Would you like to conclude, and we'll go on to the next speaker? Ah, time flies. I'm done. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Robinson. I'm Phil Mosek, followed by Garrett Co Colbert. Hi, my name is Phil Mosek, and I also have some comments about item number three, the uh, acceptance of the grant proposal. I, I urge you to look upon this and similar proposals with great skepticism. Uh, I think the Seattle Police Department have a well-earned reputation for distrust by the public, and we need you to provide meaningful and critical oversight. Um, they have tricked you repeatedly, most recently with the port security cameras. Uh, they use this port security grant, and then they threw up hundreds of surveillance nodes all over the city. Uh, in effect, the Department of Homeland Security drop a bag of money in their in their, in their laps uh, every year, and they're able to use this for things the public largely do not want. There's some good things in there, but there's lots of things we do not want. In particular, I'm concerned about this uh, facial recognition software, and I want to give you two different visions of how it might be used, because I'm afraid that you're looking at it from the way that many people are looking at it. You might picture a detective walking into the photo unit with a printout of a grainy security camera image, or a photo of a suspect who fled the scene of a crime. And a pers personnel there in the photo unit might say, all right, we'll analyze that and get back to you in a couple hours or a few minutes. In reality, this is going to happen digitally. Um, they're probably going to be transmitted across the wireless network from the cars that the, that the police officers drive around in. And uh, it's going to happen almost instantaneously. The, the trained personnel in the photo booking office may be someone sitting in a terminal that just clicks yes, 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 yes. Or maybe just sits there and watches the queries come in and get returned to the officers who send them. Also, this is supposed to be used for people who have been suspected, reasonably suspected of committing a crime. Consider that that might not be violent crimes. It might be things like pedestrian interference, things that people are charged with when they are engaging in political demonstrations. So imagine a police officer going down the street, photographing everyone who is committing civil disobedience, uh, reasonably suspected of blocking the sidewalk, and sending in every one of those photographs and identifying those people and com compiling a list of who was at a political demonstration. That's how, it will, that's how it will be used unless we put greater restrictions on it. Thanks for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Mos Mosek.
Garrett Colbert, followed by Ed Yas. Yeah. Garrett Colbert is he here? Followed by our last speaker with. I think it's our last. Yeah. Ed, <coughs> Excuse uh, me. Yasi My name Powell. is uh, Garrett Kobar, and I've a, been a Seattle citizen for 30 years. Of 25 of those years, I've been in the technology industry. Uh, the last three years, I've been researching and writing a book about privacy. Um, recently, I joined Seattle Privacy. I'm interested in more hyper-local issues now. David and Phil both touched on issues of collection of data, which is important. But what's even more important, is that data retained, and is it aggregated? In other words, if your picture is used momentarily to see if you're in a port security area or if you might have committed a crime is one thing. But when that image is then uploaded, stored, and shared at federal level or attached to other information, it gains a whole new meaning. And the, and the meaning goes beyond what we think citizenship is. I think some, I'm going to cut you guys some slack because you may not understand all the technology. But what, when something is done locally, it doesn't mean it's going to stain locally when it, once it is a digital piece of data. And this is what we need to really understand. And a lot of the language in, your, in the legislative material I reviewed does not precisely say what you're doing with this data, how long you retain it, nor does it have any real implications for authorities who may abuse this situation. So I'll close with that. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Colbert. Our last speaker will be Ed Yasakawa, if he is here. Yes. Uh, my name is Ed Yasakawa. I'm from Seattle. I'd like to address Council Bill 117996. I've written down my thoughts because I want to keep it uh, succinct. All I want to say is I oppose funding that can be used for blanket surveillance of we the people in the name of security from terrorism. To me, such an action constitutes a form of terrorism against we the people and an, and an enlargement of government. It is another step towards eliminating protections, protections of our rights. Our republic with our constitution does not delegate or allow for our government employees to destroy our rights to privacy in the name of terrorism. You have a stake, as I do, in preserving our freedoms. Do not abridge yours, ours, and future generations from moral freedoms that are our rights by bowing to organized greed for power and control over we, the people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yasukawa. That will conclude our public comment section. And uh, it seemed like all of the testimony primarily was on item number three on our agenda, which we'll get to in just a matter of minutes. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, we appreciate that. And we'll move to our first item of business. And we'll ask that Ms. Pelka and any other people on that uh, appointment can come forward. Go ahead and read the next matter into the record. Clerk file number 313589, appointment of Sam Pelka as member. Public Safety Civil Service Commission for a term of confirmation to December 31, 2016. Okay. okay. We won't hold that against either one of you. So why don't we just start with a name introduction, please? Good afternoon. My name is Sam Pelka. Okay, and Ms. Pelka is here as an applicant to be confirmed for the Public Safety Civil Service Commission. I think many people are aware of her by reputation, if not personally, for the commission. So let me just open it up with a few questions. And of course, her resume is found in a public document that we've submitted as part of the file. Uh, and you go by Sam, of course, as I do. everyone knows. Yes. So perhaps you could introduce yourself a little bit and talk about your qualifications to serve on the Public Safety Civil Service Commission. Great, thank you. Happy to do that, and thank you for having me here today. Um, I have been practicing as an attorney for 25 years now. This is my 25th year. Uh, most of that, about 17 of it, has been spent um, as a government attorney um, for King County Prosecutor's Office. That while there, I um, supervised the labor and employment section, and that's how I became familiar with um, the laws around individuals and proceedings with their employers. And then I served as the city's first um, director of the Office of Professional Accountability from 2001 through 2007, completed two three-year terms there. And I continued that focus in um, issues involving um, individuals and their um, in proceedings with their employer and the government. And then since then, I've been um, in private 
working as a private attorney for a large corporation located in headquartered here at Microsoft. And of course, my views here today are my own and not, not those of my employer, Microsoft Corporation. Um, but in that service at Microsoft, I've continued um, to focus on the area of um, investigations and issues that affect individuals in their uh, role vis-a-vis -vis their employer. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So if confirmed, you'll be replacing um, Terrence Carroll, who mm -hmm. served capably on this commission. Mm -hmm. And one of the concerns, since many of the public may not know what this commission does, but um, among several things, you will be hearing appeals from uh, public safety members, fire to fire fighters, police officers on disciplinary matters, personal matters. Um, you have a sort of a background as being an accountability uh, advocate. You are a past board member of the National Association of Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement, NACOL organization. Mm -hmm. uh, can you describe a little bit to the public as to how, how or why you think you would be fair and impartial in looking at these personnel matters? Right, and absolutely. And I should have added that my um, history includes current service as the chair of the King County Civil Service Commission, so I'm currently mm -hmm. serving in that capacity as well. I think um, if there was you know, one thing that I was um, passionate about and believe I showed, you know, consistently in service in the government is that my advocacy was never for um, individuals and wasn't on behalf of individuals, nor was it for their employer or for the government agency that I was working with. Instead, uh, the compass that I, tr I tried to follow was always that of a fair and transparent process. Um, so that was the area that that um, I placed my focus and emphasis on. I did the work that I did very publicly. I reported um, on it uh, routinely and, and regularly issued monthly reports and semi-annual reports and was always available to hear uh, and learn from critics both within and outside you know, the department in carrying out that function. Very good. Um, there's just one uh, mark on your background that causes me some pause, and that's because you're a Washington State Cougar. That's right. But other Go than Cougs. that, <laughs> <laughs> I, I did get my law degree from the UW. But that doesn't <laughs> count. <laughs> uh, do any of my colleagues have any questions of Ms. Pelka? Um, I do not have a question, but I can tell you, colleagues, that I had the great pleasure of working with Sam for a number of years. She was the chief of our employment and labor section while I was um, in the prosecuting attorney's office, and I'm just very proud of the work she's done. Um, I was involved when she was looking to come over as the first OPA, what was the title? Your OPA, OPA officer, director. 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 Mm -hmm. director. And um, I just know that she, she stood up well to all of the uh, slings and arrows that were coming her way. Um, and she wrote opinions that were articulate, clear, and fair. And I'm very pleased, Sam, that you want to do this. Great. Thank you. Great. And uh, likewise, I worked with uh, Ms. Pelka for quite a while, particularly when I was chairing the Public Safety Committee, and, and she was the Executive Director of Office of Professional Accountability, and served on um, NACOL as well, National Association of um, Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement. So uh, I have high regards for her uh, ability and accountability and openness in working. Uh, I do have a couple of questions I want to toss out, just to get your, your thoughts on them. Um, in the capacity of, the, your, assuming we approve you in this new position, there is a system of providing, uh, I guess it's called uh, preference points in hiring uh, the candidates. Um, is this something that's, is, that the office would have any input in helping to shape those preference points to give more attention to, particularly for uh, police officers, uh, experience in areas that would help them better carry out their functions. Uh, for instance, uh, maybe speaking multiple language uh, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. working uh, social or human services that would help them work with perhaps difficult uh, street right. cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with that issue, and I think I, I, I read a recent report of the OPA auditor, and Levinson, making that point and thought it was a really good, worthwhile issue to raise. I'm not sure um, about who owns the responsibility to, for, for introducing that as a factor to be considered by the city for hiring police officers, but I think it's a really worthy and legitimate topic to take up. Um, my assumption would be that that would be a legislative activity that the commission would then help to carry out and, and you know adjudicate proceedings against that. Um, but but 
um, that would be subject to, you know, advice that you would get on that point. Very good. Um, and quite honestly, again, you know, this did originate from the Ann Levinson, but it's it's one that I think has been percolating around for it, a while. It, it has. Fact, you may have mentioned it yourself in some of your reports, right. for that matter. And I remember it even um, during Chief Kurlikowski's tenure, it was an issue that, that he had introduced into the department in terms of getting uh, officers who were on probation, serving time, you know, working with social right. service agencies, and that was a... Uh, innovation of him that, uh, to my knowledge, was widely and well received within the department, and began to show some pay some really good dividends in terms of the experience and exposure of the officers to the community and their familiarity with the services that were um, available. Well, this is an issue I'd like to carry on. So, in, mm -hmm. in discussions with the other commissioners and right. other council members, is something maybe to see whose authority falls under to, right. to pursue this, mm -hmm. but I'm glad that you have an open mind on this topic. Absolutely. The the other area that came out was the composition of the commission, which just consists of three individuals, one appointed by the mayor, one from the city council, mm -hmm. and then the third person representing one of the two groups, uh, employment groups, uh, mm -hmm. police officers or firefighters that I, I believe, I don't know if they alternate or not, but they there is a third person that is appointed to the seat that represents one of those two groups. And, I believe, although I'm not sure it's necessary, that they be an active employee. Um, and with your experience at King County, was there a similar slot for that that sort of individual? You know, I, I, I know that one of the my fellow commissioners of the county is a former law enforcement right. representative and, and former jail director. Um, I don't know whether they have a, I, obviously that, that's not a requirement that they be a current member because right. we, we don't have a current member serving. Um, so I, I don't think the county operates in a similar fashion. Right. Well, that raised the issue again. Uh, it might have been Ann Levinson or someone else. I'm not sure. Um, again, this is an idea that's been kicked around for a while. Is that yeah. it, would there be a conflict of interest of having someone who's currently an employee sit on the commission as opposed to a former employee, which would add some distance? So this is another area that we'd right. probably look at. Yeah, I, and, and again, I think it's another worthy topic to explore. You know, certainly there are arguments on both sides, um, and you do have the, the makeup of the commission and, what, you know, the, whether you can constitute a quorum in the absence of that. But at, but at a minimum, I think it would be a good idea for the, either for this committee or for that commission to consider having some proposals in place to deal with um, individual conflicts or some recusal process where either at self-nomination or at the nomination of others, you can take that, at, you can at least take that issue up on a case-by-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. uh, at a minimum, that seems to me like an important fairness step. Well, something that would be done to at least uh, address that issue, which currently is not really being talked about as they're addressed. Right, right. Great topic. And, and I know that the... Um, you know, these commissions are, you know, go back a while in terms of when they were first created. And I, I, I know that the thinking has evolved. Let's hope that thinking um, and our best practices and, you know, the idea, the ways that we think about um, objectivity and impartiality have, um, have also had the benefit of, you know, a nice four decades or so to improve. So, you know, I think that there are probably a lot of aspects about the, how the commission operates that are ripe for, you know, some further and fresh consideration. And I think that's an appropriate subject area for the commission members themselves to take up. Certainly, I know that we're doing that at the county. Uh, we just completed um, a hearing. Well, we're in the process of completing a hearing there, um, and it's the first one that, um, that's been held in a while. The commission hadn't been convened very frequently, and we have all recognized that we think that part of the service that we can perform as commission members is to note and identify areas for procedural improvement, um, keeping in mind you know, the goals of the commission, which are, although it's a quasi-judicial proceeding, you really can get the highest and best use out of it if it's if it's efficient, if it operates, you know, not in a super litigious, you know, fashion that doesn't really serve any immediate um, <coughs> needs or benefits of the people who appear before it. Great. Well, thank you for, for considering those uh, ideas. Of course. Thank you for those those issues. And just um, as I call, before I call for a vote, let me just button down where we are on those two issues because we had a similar discussion with uh, Ann Levinson on the okay. on her auditor's report. On the hiring criteria issue, the executive has also made it clear that he's interested in opening up the breadth of um, what they would consider in, adi in addition to a veteran's preference. The other coaching was another, and mentoring, they, these multicultural um, backgrounds and, and language. 
So, um, and we do think that the commission may have some authority there, but even if the commission does have literal or legal authority, mm -hmm. there's still a political process dealing with other stakeholders we'd want to employ as a council. So we'll talk offline about what that may look like in the future, and that's actually okay. part of our committee's work plan. With respect to the structure of the three-member commission, that um, although I did read the auditor's report, I'm not fully convinced that uh, it still makes sense to change. It's an older rule in 1978. I think that when that police officer or firefighter is screened, that is the council's responsibility to still make sure that that person can be fair and impartial and just doesn't necessarily rubber strap every appeal. Mm -hmm. um, and that would be a poor confirmation if that person doesn't pass that scrutiny. So I'm not sure their structural change at this point needs to be made. But I'm, I'm willing to talk to the commission and other council members about that. We've demonstrated a clear ability to change outdated rules when it doesn't make sense. Uh, again, the council and the mayor has two appointees on this. Uh, two makes policy on a three-member panel. That's right. But let's we, we could revisit that. But I don't know if there's any immediate action to take on that. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I'll move clerk file three one three five eight nine. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. And Ms. Pelka, thank you so much for serving. This is truly a, a service position, and um, the city of Seattle is better off for your service. So thanks you, you can, for continuing your public service. Thank you. I really look forward to the opportunity. Okay. All right. Thanks. All right. Take care. Thank you. We have one more appointment. Uh, please read the next clerk file into the record. Clerk file number 313590, reappointment of Burl Fernandez as member, Citizens Telecommunications and Technology Advisory Board for a term of confirmation to January 1, 2016. Good afternoon. Why don't we just start off with name introductions, please? Beryl Fernandez, thank you for the opportunity to present myself here. Absolutely. For reappointment uh, to CTEP, the Community Technology Advisory Board. Sure. Um, a four-decade resident of Seattle. Ms. Fernandez, can you pull the mic a little for sure. Before you start, uh, I'd like to have Ms. DeVoto introduce herself, yeah. too, just so we have... Oh, sorry about that. Not a problem. <laughs> Not a problem. Hi. Good afternoon. Aaron DeVoto, CTO. Thank you very much. And I was going to ask you a question and read your background into the record, but if you'd like to introduce yourself, that's quite frankly to you. A very <laughs> no. impressive background. Okay, I was going to brag on it <laughs> myself, but feel free to go ahead and start. Good. Um, so as I, as I was saying, I'm a four-decade resident of Seattle, and um, I have served as a policy analyst on the City Council Central staff decades ago as well. So my continued interest in serving here is threefold. One, I've been a mentor for um, youth for over 18 years, and a lot of that has been in technology, the community technology centers. I've worked with El Centro de la Raza, after school program and community technology center, uh, Rainier Beach High School, and several others. I've worked with uh, seniors and um, uh, people with disabilities, uh, Lambert House, which is an um, LGBT um, uh, youth home on uh, Capitol Hill. So I've worked with a lot of them. And I get tremendous satisfaction from seeing them go from little to no technology background to soaring to heights and winning citywide contests and having some of their work published. So that's why I'm there. And the, of course, the community technology program here is of interest to me for that reason and seeing it uh, you know, continue. Then as, um, as an independent consultant in urban planning, uh, and, and an interdisciplinary PhD in urban planning, environmental engineering, and public policy, my focus has been on urban infrastructure. By that I mean not just the physical infrastructure of roads, sewers, garbage, et cetera, but, and of, of which technology is a huge and essential part these days, but also the socioeconomic and cultural infrastructure of our community. I think that a city's health and its sustainability depends in large part, and I think one of the essential metrics ought to be, how well we look after the less vocal, the most vulnerable people in our society. So that balance, I think, is essential. I see, um, I see us uh, you know, moving ahead on huge, complex um, technology infrastructure needs at this point. And I think the ability to balance the needs of businesses, corporations, economic development, which we definitely need to sustain our city, 
together with the needs of the underemployed, unemployed, the homeless, who these days are looking for work through the internet. Making sure that they are not left behind, making sure that as we embark on these very high tech, very exciting uh, endeavors and initiatives, that we are not widening the digital divide, but actually bringing people along with us as we move ahead. And it's, it's, it's easier said than done, but I hope that pull, putting my policy analyst hat on, um, I, can, I can help balance and navigate as we move forward. So that was actually my third point. And with that as a backdrop, I ask for, your, for a reappointment. Well, thank you very much. And for those members of the viewing audience who missed it, uh, Ms. Fernandez holds a PhD from the University of Washington in interdisciplinary program in combining urban planning, environmental engineering, and public policy. And she holds a, a BA from in, as a philosophy major and a sociology minor at Bryn Mawr College in Pennsylvania, an outstanding school. Thank you very much for re being for re-upping as a reappointment to the CTAB committee. Uh, did my colleagues have any questions of Ms. Fernandez? I just, thank you for coming back to the committee. A lot, many reappointments really do not come back to a committee, so I appreciate you taking the extra time to come here and talk to us. And obviously, you've served well and you have great uh, skills and experience, so I'm very thankful that you're willing to serve again. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, me too. I just appreciate all the work that you're doing. So thank you for taking all those talents and skills and spending them with us. Thank you. Okay, great. So I will move clerk file 313590, the reappointment of Beryl Fernandez to the CTAB committee. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. And we'll present this to the full council. Thank you very much, Ms. Fernandez, for being here. Thank you. Next, will you read the uh, next sure. council bill into the file? And any presenters with respect to the UASI legislation, please come forward to the table. Council bill number 117996 relating to security from terrorism, authorizing the city to partner with the state of Washington and King County to receive financial assistance from the Department of Homeland Security, Office of State and Local Government Coordination and Preparedness under the Urban Areas Security Initiative Grant for uh, federal fiscal year 2012, authorizing an application for allocation of funds under that agreement, amending the 2013 adopted budget ordinance 124 058 by increasing appropriations to the Seattle Police Department and Seattle Fire Department and accepting revenues and ratifying and confirming prior acts all by three-fourths vote of the City Council. Okay, why don't we just start with a round of name introductions first and I'll sort of tee up the matter, please. Good morning. I'm Carmen Best, Assistant Chief of Criminal Investigations Bureau with the Seattle Police Department. I am Mark Mount, Lieutenant uh, Forensic Support Services, Seattle Police Department. Kara Miller, manager of the Forensics and Digital Imaging Section. Uh, Chris Steele, Homeland Security Grants Coordinator, Seattle Police Department. Okay, and I'm assuming uh, Central Staff Dan Eater is listening and is going to do a mad rush here pretty soon, I believe, somewhere in this. So before we tee up the discussion, uh, I want to make a few announcements. I want to walk through sort of the legislative history of this particular ordinance this particular bill to describe to the viewing audience at least sort of what's been going on here. I also wanted to take this opportunity to introduce a, uh, a quiet member of the viewing audience, Professor uh, William or Bill Covington from the University of Washington Law School. He's with the uh, senior lecturer and director of the Technology, Law, and Public Policy Clinic. They're in the audience with a few law students. And in discussions with that particular organization, they were trying to establish some kind of formal relationship with their public policy clinic, helping us deal with a lot of the technology and privacy issues. So I want to thank you for your participation with your law students as well. Uh, let me give a little background uh, on this legislation. In a couple of weeks, I will introduce a few amendments that have been sort of raised during public comment. And that would be, as you may recall, the council did pass a bill 124142 uh, that dealt with protocols whenever the department are using um, uh, technology, cameras, surveillance equipment, and we asked for certain things to occur that would satisfy our needs to protect privacy rights. Uh, facial recognition software, according to our law department, was not um, covered under that ordinance. So we will introduce an amendment to make sure that in the future, 
it will be covered under the protocol requirements. The other piece is it has come up under this ordinance that the Seattle Police Department could modify any policy documents dealing with the uh, dealing with what was approved by the council. And I would propose an amendment in a few weeks that would suggest that they notify the council before they significantly modify any policy, particularly with respect to privacy rights moving forward. And so, um, so that will occur uh, sometime in the very near future as a result of this legislation and many of the concerns raised by the, the audience. You have a question on that element. Absolutely. The, I think the issue is raised that um, the execution of the protocols are outlined in the, in the Seattle Police Manual and is because I believe that we had to, they had to provide the uh, protocols to us. We had to approve them, but not necessarily approve them in a legislative format. So your uh, proposal for going forward, at not this meeting, but at another future meeting, is that if they make changes to the execution of the protocol in, and I, I think it's the police manual is where it would be housed, um, they need to notify us? Or notify the council, correct. If they've changed it in the police manual? Correct. Okay. okay. Um, and the department has indicated they don't have a problem with that, and they would no doubt do that anyway. Uh, but we want to make sure that the public understands that we are involved in policy changes at the department level with respect to these technology changes. So this legislation, I'll refer to it as a UASI legislation, actually was presented uh, back in November of 26. Uh, during a meeting where the uh, last year it was presented that there was a, there was a funding possibility and that this uh, this photo booking system would be introduced. Uh, this legislation was given to council during the week of November 25th. It was referred to our committee on December 2nd and following that before presentation uh, members of the police department and and myself and my staff, and I believe center staff met with the department, and we made it clear, at least as public safety chair, that before this committee would take any vote, that we'd like to make sure that public outreach was done. Uh, particularly, uh, we wanted the ACLU, who's been very instrumental in these, uh, these issues, to confirm their involvement and their actually appro approval of the policies that the department were ac asking us to adopt. <coughs> uh, during that, that was, holiday season, of course, in December. The police department requested a postponement from the legislation in, in December uh, until next year, this year, 2014. At this point, we also sought legal uh, clarification as to whether this uh, photo booking system, whether our protocol requirement applied to this. And we were told in writing that it does not. And we, we got an opinion to that effect. Uh, in January, my staff sent an email to the police department uh, asking for an update on the UASI legislation and this, in particular the booking photo comparison software. Um, the, the department replied very promptly saying that they were still doing public outreach and that the matter would be ready in February. We then sent, the department then sent us an email on January 31st uh, with an updated uh, policy and a formal documentation of ACLU's involvement in developing the policy document. This was confirmed. Um, again, uh, in the direction of the chair, myself, we directed the work, we continue to ask the SPD to work with the ACLU and other community members, such as the Seattle Privacy Coalition and others, on looking at this document. Uh, we scheduled two hearings on this matter, February 5th, February 19th today, to ensure that the public had an opportunity to weigh in. Uh, and, there were, and from those discussions, several questions have been raised. Um, again, the ACLU was sitting here at the table on February 5th, and according to Doug Clunder, who is an ACLU privacy counsel, I'll just quote what he said during the last meeting. He says, please feel free to let the committee members know that the ACLU is pleased that the Seattle Police Department narrowed its policy on the booking photo comparison software to apply to suspects only, and that we have no objections to the policy as written. And that was an email dated February 16th. So I think we've done... Um, We've done our outreach. We've had a public discussions. Uh, I did ask Dan Eater at some point to come here because there was a title error or, or clarification we need to make, uh, yeah. certainly because of it was last year's weird. It was a fiscal 
we had the wrong year on there for the fiscal clarification. So, so there is a conflict. Uh, Dan is unable to be here at okay. this this committee. So I, I know the issue. So I'll walk us through what the what that is. Just a title change uh, that we that was neglected to be put into legislation. So now, what there are some questions that I will ask uh, the department that um, that have been raised, and. Before I ask those questions, Councilman Licata had a question. Um, are you suggesting there's a title change? Do we need to do a substitute then? So let me walk through through what's going to happen there. So we're, we cannot. This is according to center staff. So we cannot vote vote today right. because the title is the incorrect title. Right. We will refer it with the correct title change on Monday. Because it's a bill and not a resolution, you cannot vote on it the same day. So. It will be presented to the council on March 3rd, a week after, according to our bylaws. On a March 3rd, you're going to have to present the full council because four members, including myself and Councilman Bagshaw, are on an educational trip, and um, and that's the earliest we can do it legally, according to our bylaws. Councilman Bagshaw. Chair, today I heard a number of concerns from people that were here talking to us about their worries about this. Are there some tapes that they can go back and look at, or are there some opportunities for them to get their questions answered about work that's previously been done? Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, we've gone over it pretty extensively, but the questions I was just getting ready to present before uh, Councilmember Lakata asked the question sort of zeroes in on those concerns that we've reduced to writing that I was going to ask the department to address. Councilmember Lakata, do you that, have That's to? fine. That answered the question okay. whether, because when you said title change, yeah. It occurred to me it's that we the, would be voting today. And just so I'm clear that the, the, because the legislation was prepared last year, the title had us amending the budget for the fiscal year 2013, not 2014. So we just have to change the, the number 2013 to 2014. And so, so that's that. Okay. So one of the questions that have arisen on this legislation is, um, is the intent to give our police officers the authority to photograph any individual who was stopped pursu pursuant to a Terry versus Ohio stop. You know, there's some reason to stop this person. And could an officer just use his or her cell phone to take pictures of a suspect and then ask, and then ask, and then ask the department whether there's a match or not? So basically, is it intended for Terry stops? And I, I can answer that, that the policy is not intended for Terry stops. It's intended for instances where there is a stationary, um, a stationary place such as a store or a taxi cab or ATM where, where they have an image of a person and we capture that image and we are unable to identify the image and we can compare it to um, booking photo comparison software where we have, where a person's been booked, arrested, photographed, and fingerprinted. But it's not intended for Terry stops or anything of that nature. May I? Okay. Please. And, and let, me, let, let me clarify what I mean by Terry stops just so that the mm -hmm. audience knows. You know, a Terry stop could be brief. A Terry stop can, um, uh, permits a, a brief investigative stop. It could take a few minutes, a few seconds. And in, in another life, in other jurisdictions, some departments can use a Terry stop as a means to do other things. And so the question is whether this software would be used for a Terry stop. Councilmember Licata. Well, actually, two things. One, we've been joined at the table by someone. You may want to introduce that person. I'm sorry. Uh, yes. Please do. Thank you. Oh, hi. Uh, I am Nika Dalbaka. I'm the co-chair of the Seattle Human Rights Commission. Yes. And then I'll have a question right after Nick. Yes. Thank, Thank you me. for being here. Yeah. Um, when, uh, Chief, when you say that it's not intended, I, I believe it, but does that also open the door for the possible use since it's not intended but allowed? Well, for, for a Terry stop, if you have the person there, I mean, the, the point of the booking photo comparison software is to compare somebody we haven't identified when a crime has been committed or there's reasonable suspicion to believe that there's a crime um, with the uh, photos that are in the booking photo comparison software. On a Terry stop, the person is there. Um, you can talk to them, and I, there's no reason to not get their, you know, talk to them at that point get the information and follow up on your investigation appropriately. So th there are two different circumstances altogether. I mean, again, just to pursue this, with a Terry stop, would an officer be allowed to take someone's uh, photograph and then go back to the station and, and compare it? 
I don't know of any circumstance where that would occur. Um, usually photographic inf uh, photographs would be taken if there's evidence of a crime that's been committed. A Terry stop is not uh, evidence of a crime. It, it, we were specific in this policy to reasonable su suspicion. So it's, it doesn't apply in this circumstance. OK. Thank you. Um, moving on, can the police department record the race of each individual for whom an inquiry made, it would it be useful? Uh, do they believe that they'll use? I'm sorry, I'll just read a question as it is rather than interpret. It says, Can SPD record the race of each individual for whom an inquiry is made using this software? And the software, my understanding of the way it works is that it takes a mathematical algorithm and it looks at the eyes, the nose, the cheeks, and the chin and it determines, um, based on that algorithm, whether or not you have a likely uh, match. So it does not uh, take into account skin color, gender, or, um, or hair. So it would not be able to determine race from the, from the system itself. And that would be a subjective thing. So we would not have the officers. I mean, it would be a guess, you know. And so we wouldn't want the officers to do that. And here's some questions coming from the Seattle Privacy Group. And again, I want to thank them for their advocacy and concern whenever the city uses or the government uses technology or surveillance equipment. So how is a suspect defined uh, where it will trigger the use of this, um, this software? So per the policy, there has to be reasonable suspicion. So an officer has to reasonably believe that a person has been involved in a crime or committed a crime or is a, um, an accomplice to a crime and that would uh, render them in the, as a suspect. OK, and so you heard some testimony about um, the, the images or the photos are dumped into a d database. So what's the limit? To, how do you limit what photos will be dumped into the database? Um, it, the photos are, if we have a, an image of a person that is involved in a crime that we can't identify, we will compare it to the photos that are already in um, the booking photo comparison software. And those are from people who have been uh, arrested, photographed, fingerprinted, and booked. The image that we bring in is not, is not maintained in a database. The comparison is done, and then that image is um, destroyed or disposed of. It's not, we don't keep those images. So uh, there's been some concern about Is that correct? mission creep. Did, uh, did Mr. Blount or anyone want to add anything? Did anyone want to add I anything? I heard something. That's okay. why I said. Okay. I was okay. clearing my voice. Or okay. Clearing my voice. Well, don't clear your voice during the Q&A. Yeah, I'm talking. <laughs> Just to clarify really quickly, the, uh, the photos that you say that of, of the individuals that have been booked, those are the official mugshot booking photos, right? Yes. So, I mean, in terms of image accuracy for the comparison photo, there aren't very many environmental factors sullying the, the accuracy of that comparison of the, book, of the booking photo that's in the yeah, system. Yeah, because it's right. all kind of, it's all the same background, it's all the same For the most lighting, part, yes. things right. like that. But where did those come from, and how do you restrict okay. others being added to uh, that database? I'm sorry, uh, sir. I, I, I can't hear you, number one, but number two, it's not time for public comment. So we, there's heard some testimony about mission creep or usage creep over the course of time. The, uh, the police department wants to use it for what they're saying now, uh, but it'll creep over into other things. Can you describe what's to prevent usage creep? Well, a couple of things. One is going to be audited uh, on a yearly basis. And part of that audit, every time someone comes in to utilize the equipment, there's one person that uses it. So if, I, if the detective or whoever brings in an image that they're looking to compare it to the booking photo comparison software, then the operator um, from our photo unit will he, that's the only person who does that. And then every year it's audited by our audit unit. And on that, they will include, and I'll have to read it right directly from the policy, but the date of the inquiry, the name of the person making the inquiry, the name of the officer requesting, a description of the incident that satisf satisfies all the criteria in the manual section, and the offense number. So that'll be audited every year. And in conjunction with that, we know that there's a, going to be an ordinance in place that precludes us from doing anything more with, with that software. So, Thank you very much. Uh, Councilor Baron Bagshaw. Thank you. Um, Chief Best, uh, I think the concern that I've heard from the audience and I've heard um, four years ago from Phil and others when Parks had some cameras up in mm -hmm. Capitol Hill, the worry was not so much that we would misuse the data that we have right now, but that it would be 
in the future something that a citizen who's just walking through the park, who's just walking along the street, could get their photograph in the database and then suddenly be a suspect for something that they had no involvement in at all. How would you reassure someone who's concerned about their civil rights if they're not a suspect, never have been a suspect, but just happened to be at the wrong time walking into 7-Eleven? Well, what we're comparing the images to is uh, a database where people have been booked into jail. So they've been, they've been arrested, they've been fingerprinted, they've been photographed, and they've been booked. There are no other photos that are in the booking photo comparison software. And the imagery, the image has to have reasonable suspicion that a person has been involved in a crime. So walking through a park certainly isn't reasonable suspicion of a crime. It would be something along the lines of like a bank photo of somebody with a the, with the gun holding it to the teller or something like that where we have an image of, of that nature that we'd be comparing it to. So if there's not reasonable suspicion of a crime, uh, there's no reason to believe they're involved in anything, there's no reason to uh, compare that image or even take that image. I have a quick follow-up. So, know, be, before you do, can, sure. Uh, Ms. DeBuck, I forgot I was supposed to call on her after your first question. In, right, I, yeah. I we have, I have one more thing. We are wondering, what is the threshold for accuracy for the photo comparison to trigger action? So, should you have uh, this photo that you've taken from a bank or, mm -hmm. you know, when there's a reasonable suspicion of a crime, how accurate does the match have to be for you to then take action against the, the photo that it matches in your database? Well, a couple of things. So the, the database will come up with, a, you know, a, if it comes up with a comparison, a, a hit, if you will, then the detective um, and the person with, who is operating the software will look, will, will take a visual look to see if it actually makes, because the software is comparing eyes, nose, chin and cheeks. So that they would take a visual look and see if there's actual, uh, before they went any further and pursue anything additional. It's not an automatic, if it has, if you come up, then automatically you're, you're the suspect of the crime. It's, it's an additional tool for us to take a look at who possibly may be involved. Right, and my understanding is that the software that's usually used for this will give you a percentage match of the images. So say something like 70 to 90 percent uh, image match, you know, for the for the criteria of the nose and the cheeks and the face. So I, I was just wondering if the police have a set threshold for where they will then sit down and look and try to verify or... Yeah. Again, ahead, it really depends on the search engine you use. There's four or five different major search engines such as NEC, Cognitech, MorphoTrack, and as far as their, uh, you know, percentage, I think it really just depends on um, the algorithms that they're using. Um, I know that there's a couple highly rated v uh, vendors that rely off what they call a NIST standard, which is uh, National Institute of Science and Technology, and as far as accuracy. But again, this is what we would call lead generator. In a sense, you will get you know anywhere from top five candidates to top twenty candidates. It really just depends on what you're willing to set as how many images you choose to want to look at. Uh, again, it will be up to the detective to do the investigative work to go beyond just what they have when it when it prints out on the comparison. Casarone Licata? Yeah, that's fine. You sure? Yeah. Uh, Nika, did you have any other questions? No, that was, that was I, I guess it will depend then on the vendor selection and what kind of thresholds they have okay. for follow-up. Well, we had a fairly lengthy conversation uh, in our last meeting, and I didn't want the department to have to repeat everything. Uh, again, I introduced, when some of the issues had surfaced, I uh, committed ourselves to amending uh, our protocol legislation to make sure that we stay on top of any policies. Um, and so if there aren't any other questions, uh, again, I wanted to make sure that we invited the Human Rights Commission, we've invited the ACLU, we continue to talk offline to as many folks as possible. I, we respect uh, deeply the Seattle Privacy Coalition and all the uh, privacy uh, rights advocates out there to make sure the government is doing, is being responsible. So uh, again, we will not vote on the matter today. It will be referred with the corrected title next Monday. Then a week will pass, and then, and then Councilmember Lakata will present it to a 
council of five, I believe, <laughs> on that particular day, um, and we'll get it moved forward. Okay. Great. And so with, it, with that, I want to thank all of you for once again participating in this discussion. And with that, we'll stand adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Carmen, I need to talk to you for one.